being here with us this afternoon for Region 2 of the Network of the National Library of Medicine, um, our very first solo sponsored webinar. Um, so excited to have um, so many people have registered for this and those of you who are here already, um, thank you, thank you, thank you. We are excited for this first session. Um, we will be going um, starting now um, at 2 and we expect it to last 45, 50 minutes, and we will have questions at the end. Um, before I introduce our speaker, just a few housekeeping things. A uh, reminder that everybody has been muted uh, to cut down on any background noise. Uh, any questions or comments that you have, please go ahead and put in the chat box, and I will um, facilitate them at the end when, when our speaker is done. And remember to select everyone when you submit the um, questions so that others can see it in case anybody else happens to have the same question also. Um, and finally, if you need or want to use closed captioning, we have that as an option that you can turn on um, through, I believe it's, oh, I might need some help with this. Oh, on the left-hand side of your screen, there's the so show captions option. So that will be there. Um, okay, today's session will be recorded and made available afterward. Um, we will follow up with the registrants on uh, where that will be viewable. Um, at this time, I'm sorry, I'm not able to tell you exactly where we'll put it, but but it will be somewhere and we'll make sure that you uh, that you get that. Um, like I said, feel free to ask questions as we go through, um, but let me, uh, Go ahead and introduce our speaker uh, today with us. I am so happy to introduce to you uh, Jamie Stanfield. Uh, Jamie is a business and health librarian and online learning coordinator at the University of Southern Mississippi. She has a Master of Arts in History, uh, Master of Library and Information Science, and is currently working on her PhD um, with uh, at Southern Mississippi studying Mississippi midwives. So super excited about this work that she's doing and looking forward to learning more about that later. Um, her professional interests include developing the graphic novel collection in her library with a specific focus on a newer genre known as graphic medicine. Currently, she's working with a professor at the University of Bologna. Bologna? I, I'm destroying that. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, to develop a graphic medicine course for their university's master's students. That's very excited. Um, Jamie's active in the Mississippi, Mississippi Library Association, the Southeastern Library Association, um, ALA, and the Southern Chapter of the Medical Library Association, and also with the Atmospheric Science Librarians International, which I think sounds really cool. I don't know anything about that, but I'd like to learn more about it. Um, in 2021, Jamie and two university colleagues received the Will Eisner Graphic Novel Innovation Grant from ALA's Graphic Novel Roundtable and the Will Eisner Foundation. Um, in the little bit of free time that Jamie has, she enjoys decorating her home and off office in Gothic and horror styles, reading comics, playing World of Warcraft, and watching horror movies. So um, I think we're set for an exciting, <laughs> exciting uh, uh, lecture from, from Jamie this afternoon. Um, also, at the end of the session, uh, we'll be collecting demographic information, so I will put a link in the chat once once we get to the end. And we also have um, uh, CE available through the Medical Library Association, which will be, once you do the um, uh, evaluation portion, there will be another link to take you to the CE. Okay, so it's my pleasure to uh, introduce again uh, Jamie Stanfield, and Jamie, go ahead and take it over. Okay, thank you so much, Heather. I'm so happy to be here today. I'm going to go ahead and uh, screen share so that we can get started. And if everybody could just let me know, do you see uh, the PowerPoint? Yes, Jamie. Yes. Excellent. Okay, cool. Well, as Heather said, my name's Jamie Stanfield. Today, I'm going to talk with you a little bit about health literacy. It just got graphic. Uh, on the screen, you can see lots of different medical words. And of course, my favorite cat who doesn't really like me very much, but 
I forced to come to all of my webinars. On the screen are so many different words. If you're not medically oriented, some of things can be, you know, extremely burdensome if you don't know what they mean. And so that's kind of what I want to talk about today. So, as Heather said, I'm Jamie Stanfield. I work at the University of Southern Mississippi. I'm at our Gulf Coast Library. And this is a picture of the front of the campus. And yes, that is the beach right across the street. Uh, so, it is a wonderful beachfront campus. We have a beautiful library, and I'm just happy to be a part of Southern Mississippi. So, we needed to create some learning objectives for today so that everybody could get some. Uh, continuing education units and basically by the end of this seminar, you will learn how to incorporate graphic works to increase public and personal health literacy. You'll learn how to engage patrons, patients and others using graphic medicine to improve understanding of their healthcare journey, not yours. Learn methods to apply graphic medicine to health information systems. And finally, understand how graphic medicine reduces stigma, feelings of isolation, and facilitates open communication. So, first, we need to talk a little bit about health literacy. What is it? Well, fortunately, there's some brand new guidelines and definitions that just came out from the US Department of Health and Human Services, uh, and it's in their Health People 2030. And they divided it up into two, both our personal health literacy and organizational health literacy. The personal health literacy kind of resembles the traditional one that they've been using for years. And it's the degree to which individuals have the ability to find, understand, and use information and services to inform health-related decisions and actions for themselves and others. The organizational health literacy is the degree to which organizations equitably enable individuals to find, understand, and use information and services to inform health-related decisions and actions for themselves and others. Basically, if you don't have at least a functioning health literacy rate, you are not going to be able to make good health care decisions for yourself. And that could be detrimental to people's health. If we don't have the tools to teach equally across the board, all different types of people, then we are not doing our job to make sure that our communities understand the decisions that are before them. So some of the spooky health literacy statistics are currently nearly nine out of 10 adults have difficulty using everyday health information that's routinely available in healthcare facilities, such as the hospitals, public health departments, clinics, retail outlets, media, that's a problem. People get a lot of misinformation online and their communities. Only 12% of English speaking adults in the United States have proficient health literacy skills. And by proficient, I mean that they can follow the instructions that might be on discharge papers. They can read uh, the labels on their medication and know how to take it. So imagine if you are not functioning at proficient health literacy. They also can read enough and find the information to make appropriate healthcare decisions. But about 45% of high school graduates have limited health literacy because it's just really not discussed in school. Literacy and health literacy are two totally different things. You can have a high degree of literacy, be extremely educated, and still have a low or limited uh, health literacy rate. And so, as you can imagine, um, the impact of limited health literacy disproportionately affects lower socioeconomic and minority groups simply because of access. So the poorer you are, usually the less access to information you have and less access to credible information that you have. And we have to remember that not everybody has uh, internet, a laptop, computers, cell phones, lots of people still don't. So we do have several at-risk populations 
And these are new immigrants, refugees, as you can imagine. Uh, they don't know our healthcare system. They don't know where to go. They don't have a, a standing in the community yet. And so likely they're going to be at risk. Those that don't complete high school or have a GED, they tend to have lower health literacy rates simply because even after high school, their access is going to be limited to information and their ability to search for and find credible information about health is going to be limited. If English is your second language, you can be at risk simply because even though we do have Spanish labels, Spanish instructions, we have lots of different health areas where Spanish is the language that's used, if that's your primary language, predominantly by and large in our medical system here in the United States, English is the predominant language. So you can imagine if you had a bottle of pills and it said take once daily, and let's say you were Spanish, well, O-N-C-E is 11 in Spanish. So imagine if you took that to mean you were supposed to take 11 pills. So there can be some issues there. Uh, over 65, I'm gonna use my mother as a prime example. My mother's 77 years old. She still doesn't have a computer. She still relies on a print newspaper for information. She does watch the television, but whenever she has a question related to her health, she usually calls me simply because I used to be a nurse and I do kind of uh, study a little bit more, especially as a health librarian. And so she calls and talks to me and we usually look it up together on my computer. But this is this is really reflective. A lot of uh, elderly in our society, a lot of them grew up without computers. I was on the cutting edge when AOL and Windows 95 came out. I was still young and both of my parents grew up without it at all. So they're not really used to looking for information. And a lot of times they don't even know how to search for it, even if they do have someone with a computer. And then again, low income or impoverished. The problem there is access. A lot of times they don't have access to health care, much less health care information. So these can definitely uh, be at risk populations. So intergraphic medicine, you know, what is graphic medicine and how can it possibly help with health literacy rates across the country? Well, first I need to uh, give kudos to the person that created the term graphic medicine, and that was Dr. Ian Williams. And he's still very active in uh, the field of graphic medicine. And he said that it's the intersection of the medium of comics and the discourse of healthcare. Basically, comics meets healthcare. Now, typically it's called or listed as graphic novels or the subject heading of comic books, comma strips comma ETC if you're a librarian, and most search systems don't recognize graphic medicine as a subject or a genre, so you would probably have to look up the graphic novels and then from there start to look at different medical subjects, and you would probably have to even put in something like graphic novels and Alzheimer's or graphic novels and diabetes. You can't just go in and start searching for graphic medicine hopefully one day, but currently it's not set up like that. But one of the most important things about graphic medicine is it is an outlet for storytelling that normally you don't see in the medical textbooks. Yes, there might be a picture of a man and a little excerpt about this person, but you don't know anything about them personally. And a lot of times graphic medicine is created by the person on the healthcare journey, whether they be the patient, the family, or the caregivers that's taking care of somebody, and also sometimes healthcare workers uh, and their experiences. And so it's a very personal experience that you are not going to typically find in your normal textbooks or on WebMD for that matter. Oops, sorry about that. So, why should we read graphic medicine? Well, once again, it, on a personal level like it is, 
it increases our empathy. It helps us to understand the caregiver or the person's point of view that's discussing their story, right? It allows us to really understand where they're coming from. And sometimes as healthcare workers, we forget that. And so we certainly wanna make sure that we cover things in such a comprehensive manner that we understand all sides of the coin. And graphic novels and graphic medicine by proxy appeal to diverse learners. Um, visual learners are gonna be drawn in by the pictures and it's very uh, good at drawing in reluctant and poor readers like graphic novels tend to do. And also it increases health literacy. So if you're reading about someone who has a specific condition, then you're going to walk away from that graphic novel, understanding more about that particular medical condition. So where can we use it? Well, we can use it anywhere that there is some kind of health or healthcare um, institution or organization or provider. So that would be clinics, hospitals, public health locations, I can easily see some of these books in pediatricians offices. They could definitely be on different floors uh, of the hospital. They could be in hospital libraries so that uh, staff could come and read them and, you know, take them to their patients or they could be on the floor. So many different places, certainly in all different types of libraries, public libraries, academic libraries, school libraries. You do have to kind of watch uh, the content as to where they go in children's young adult or adult, uh, but there is something for everyone. Now, online, you're going to see just about anywhere you can go. There's some kind of free web comic. There's some kind of free graphic novel and some that you pay for, but they are available all over. We can use these in online classes. We could use these on online blogs or any other place where you have a voice or a platform. Higher education, this is where I try to push graphic medicine. In our classes like psychology, uh, of course our allied health and pre-med and nursing and uh, the three therapies, physical, respiratory, and the other ones, social work, sociology, so many different classes can use and utilize graphic medicine in many different ways. And then, of course, we can also begin to introduce our students in elementary through high school to health literacy via graphic medicine. Uh, it provides an opportunity that they might not have otherwise. Maybe they don't get more than one health class, and perhaps that's an opportunity to increase their health literacy as teachers when we become knowledgeable that this can help. Now, this particular slide is something that I made just to show you how easy this can be. I downloaded all of the manga characters and I used this for another presentation, but I added the books to the computer. These are gonna be some of the books that we talk about today. Rx, uh, up here is Wrinkles, it's about Alzheimer's. And I just added all of the uh, thought and speak bubbles to this and put it on a poster, right? And so some of the key terms are, you know, we know that pictures and text together uh, has increased perception and understanding, retention and recall versus just text alone. We remember these things much longer and we're able to understand them better when we have text and pictures together. Pictures can cross language barriers where sometimes texts cannot. Uh, they're very affordable. Graphic medicine, you can get used copies for pennies on the dollar, and a lot of new copies are less than $20. They're very, very affordable. And they're not just for kids. Some of these are extremely adult oriented. Excuse me. And we have to make sure that we understand this. So this is something that, like I said, I put together and it's just so easy to do. 
These are some examples of graphic medicine. Uh, we're going to talk about a few of them today. I wish I had time to just talk to you all afternoon about all of these, but unfortunately we can't. But I wanted you to just kind of see the different types of medical issues that these cover. The first two, mom's cancer, self-explanatory. Uh, this is about somebody's mother who had cancer, and then he created this graphic medicine work. Then you also have about Betty's boob. This is about breast cancer. We're going to talk a little bit about this one. Taking turns. This is about an HIV AIDS unit, and this was written by a nurse who's very, very active in graphic medicine, M.K. Zerwick. And she talks about in this her perception of the HIV AIDS unit back when it was uh, when HIV AIDS was there just wasn't a lot known about it. Black Hole by Charles Burns. This is used across the board in a lot of higher education classic uh, classes. It's become quite a classic, but basically it's about teenagers that uh, contract an S STD and what happens to them. Menopause is my newest one. I actually um, have it sitting right here next to me. It is an anthology of so many different comics about menopause. And you know, that's something that women don't feel free to talk about in our society. And so I think it's wonderful that all of these artists came together and created this, uh, this book. And I do believe it won an Eisner Award, if I'm not mistaken. The next one is RX, which stands for prescription. We're going to talk a little bit about this bipolar disorder. Uh, very, very great book um, by Rachel Lindsay. Kid Gloves. I wish we could talk about this. This is kind of what it seems. It's one woman's journey to get pregnant and all the things that she had to go through. And then when she did, all of the things that she had to go through. And she has just such a great sense of humor, yet there's so many, so many facts in this book that are true about what women experience during pregnancy, and certainly some of the history of obstetrics is also in here, and I just love how she puts it. And then my, de my degeneration. And so you can look at any of these books, you can buy them, you could probably check them out if you don't. Have them in your library. Um, ILL them if you can. They're great books. I am not sure what's happening with this PowerPoint. But we are going to talk about first year out, a transition. This is all about transgender surgery and the problems and the complications and the stress that a person goes through. And sometimes we need to keep that in mind. So. The story begins and there's already the mom is saying, you know, I've done something wrong. Clearly, I didn't raise you right. And there's also shame. Uh, the mom is saying, you know, this is all in your head. Uh, she then asks, you know, is this a sex thing? So there's all these different types of reactions other than acceptance at first. Then as the hormone therapy takes place, you have all of these changes in the body. But by and large, even though it can be stressful and, and there are a lot of physical changes, most people actually report a, an emotional stability, a feeling of stability after they've been on the hormone replacement therapy for a little while. After the surgery, which is very physically painful, you have a lot of things that you have to overcome. And this is a very, very graphic book. It looks just because it's colorful, uh, much different than what it actually is. It's definitely for adults or at least older teens. And, you know, ask yourself when you're looking at these, depending upon what kind of library you work in, could this be challenged as inappropriate material? And if so, why? Uh, if this was put into a children, young adult section, in a public library, you could see maybe a parent possibly challenging this. In an academic library, we have a little bit less challenging, but anybody that knows about Banned Book Week knows that we still have books banned uh, across the nation. So you have to be really careful. You have to write a good collection development policy 
what are you going to do if you are challenged? How are you going to handle this? Because it can happen. And so you need to make sure that you do the legwork prior instead of being confronted and not knowing what to do. So the second book that I just wanted to show you a little bit about is about Betty's Booth. This is a French work and it doesn't have a lot of words in it. And basically there's a lot of symbolism in here. On the first uh, page you see Betty, she's laying down. There's a lot of crabs crawling all over her. And a lot of people might associate the crab with cancer. But again, there could be a cultural barrier here for people that don't know astrology and the zodiac signs. So while it is wordless, it's certainly not automatically understood by everyone. But in any event, the symbolism is that she has cancer. There are people that think maybe STD called crabs, but you go on to realize very quickly what's happening with Betty. Ultimately, she ends up getting chemo, a mastectomy, and this little excerpt on the second page shows that she's had hair loss. She's waking up. She's clearly miserable. She immediately goes to grab her wig. You can see the stitches uh, where her breast was. And you can clearly see by the end of this panel that she is definitely in distress. And I'm sure anyone that has either been through this or perhaps newly diagnosed could see this happening and could really relate to this. Ultimately, though, uh, Betty outgrows her life. This is a book that has a lot of judgment, a lot of shame, no words. She's ostracized from her work by her boss, who tells her she should not be coming to work looking like that. And by like that, I mean with one flat breast simply because Betty couldn't afford the prosthetic. So she ends up using an apple, and that still isn't good enough. There is a very happy ending. This is a fictional story, but it is certainly relatable for anybody that has been through this or may be going through this. The next one is Rx, or Prescription, and this is a nonfiction story by Rachel Lindsay. This is her journey through bipolar disorder while working for the pharmaceutical industry. It's an absolutely wonderful book. It's one of the first graphic medicine works that I read. And once she really starts, uh, once she gets diagnosed, she feels trapped by her medication. She feels like it's just a vicious cycle of working to have insurance, to cover medicine, to take medicine, to work and the circle goes round and round and round. And she feels more like a prisoner. When she does have highs and lows, her perception of how the nurses and doctors are viewing her can be seen clearly from the middle, from a patient's chart. And you can see all of the different highs and lows and descriptions. And you can see that there is the use of the F word and that is used numerous times throughout the work. Again, we have to remember this is this person's journey and this is how they're going to relate it to us. So you just have to keep in mind where to put these. But ultimately, she's ending up trying to get away from them and everything. And it's just a really great, great book talking about bipolar disorder, which is a very misunderstood disorder in our society. Black Hole, I told you, is a classic by Charles Burns. Uh, the pictures that I gave you are the yearbook pictures before contracting the STD and then after. And literally, uh, teenagers start to mutate and only teenagers can get it. And there's so much shame, judgment. Ultimately, uh, teenagers, if they get it, they leave. They hide out in the forest. They're isolated. They're angry. Eventually, even their basic needs for food and shelter are a challenge. And a lot of people read a lot into this in different types of classes. But basically, it's a story about teenagers that contract an STD. And I think it's very relevant for our society today. There's always something for everyone with graphic medicine and uh, for 
those of you that work with pediatrics, perhaps you're an elementary or junior high school librarian, or maybe you're a teacher. In any event, MediKids is an absolutely wonderful way to not only introduce children to the different types of uh, healthcare journeys that they might be on, but it works very well for parents as well. And what I mean by that is a lot of times children might be diagnosed with something or they might be in the hospital for a surgery for a reason. And parents don't fully understand exactly what's going on, but maybe they're afraid to ask because they think they should. These books provide a very great bonding opportunity between the parents and the children. And this is especially helpful if you have parents that speak English as a second language. Maybe their child knows exactly how to read this and can then explain things to them. Uh, if the parents and the children are reading this together, again, creates a great bonding opportunity. Nurses could read this to their patients, go get this for them. Uh, health librarians can provide this. So many different avenues that we can use this. Um, and there's different things that we talk about. And these are heroes. And as you can see, the heroes are kind of named for their, uh, what they take care of in the body. You have gastro, which is uh, means stomach. Pump is responsible for the circulatory system. And all of them appear in the different MediKids books. We have here probably about 20 MediKids. There are so many out there. If you go to jumohealth.com, like I have on the PowerPoint slide, you can download the current one about infection for free and share it with anyone that you like. And it's really relevant with what we're going through right now. I'm sure there's probably gonna eventually be a MediKids and, co and the COVID pandemic. But there are so many different ones that you can choose from that are so relatable. So teaching with graphic medicine is more than just books that I described so far. There are comics, there are cartoons, there are audio nims, games that you can make up yourself. There are zines that you can make up yourself and do with classes or patients or students, just about anybody. So on the web, there are so many free comics that you are free to download and print off and share uh, at Revolve Comics. They have three of them that are free that really discuss diabetes, one, in depth. And they too have some superheroes, but I really like how the little villains are explained when you get hyper or hypoglycemia. And there I'm talking myself in the jargon, and that's just basically high and low blood sugar. And it's really, uh, uh, there's some neat uh, comics. And so I encourage you, go to revolve.com, check those out, or Revolve Comics. Just Google it, you'll get there. Graphicmedicine.org is a, a, a fabulous website that I have learned so very much about. And they do a lot of comics reviews. And I go there when I'm looking for specific graphic medicine works and they have some excellent, excellent reviews. They have comics, uh, this particular comic, MPD for you and me is a comic about multiple personality disorders and it's free. And what I like about graphicmedicine.org's reviews is they also give you the site where to get it if you can purchase it, they tell you about that. They do comics and books and just various things that are available. The Courage to Be Me is another review that they have available. Very, very short works and most of them are available on the web. The Annals Graphic Medicine is just a fabulous site for cartoons. Uh, this one just really struck me because here we have a child who's clearly in the hospital and all of the healthcare workers are, you know, all in their PPE, but this is how the, the child sees them, you know, as monsters coming after them. 
So there are some excellent comics here and some panels uh, that just go on and on, and they're just free to read and, you know, learn about. And I encourage you to go there and check them out. There's also a lot of free stuff that can be used by um, physicians, nurses, health librarians, in any aspect, even education students would benefit from this. And the first one that I was going to show you is, of course, Sesame Street. And this is a little poster that you can print off about COVID-19, right? They have others, and this, but this seems so relevant. I wanted to just share this. These you could possibly uh, print off in your physician's office and PD clinics, you know, just anywhere. There's also some free posters from the UN. And those are the top two and 1 is in Africanus. They have 6 different languages that you can print off posters about social distancing. Here's 1 about hand washing in the 21st century. Everyone in the healthcare industry still knows that the single most effective way of presenting uh, preventing the spread of disease is washing your hands with soap and water. And you have to wash them properly. And so it's really important that we teach this to kids. These are completely free and you can give them out as you like because they're from the UN. They also have some uh, African origins that's there that are really printable or savable and you can use them in any way that you see fit. And then of course, across the internet, there's a lot of comics that very relatable to Gen Z. Uh, first, we have one of our Gen Zers hiding behind the recliner all by their self. And they're being told that, you know, together, 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 stay close. But we can't be close. Why? Because social distancing. Then, of course, in 2020, uh, the world is on fire, but here's your diploma. We are really happy that you know you're going to be going out there. Uh, I just thought those were so relatable to our Gen Zers right now with COVID-19 and certainly last year. You can also teach health literacy using audio nymphs. You can make audio nymphs. Your students can make flashcards. Uh, little pediatric patients could make these types of flashcards to understand some of the health terms that are going to be coming their way depending upon what they may be in the hospital for. Uh, this is especially good for hospital librarians, uh, just anybody in the healthcare industry or teaching health literacy. Over three decades ago, and I said I wasn't going to say how long over three decades, I learned these two specifically, and I still remember them to this very day. The only exception is instead of a lady wearing a blue fur with eyelids. I learned that on a lady's eyelashes were blue fur coats, and that's how I understood that bluffer means eyelid. I've never forgotten it. Same with the gas truck. Instead of the gas tank being on the back, there's a stomach. And now I remember, you know, some over three decades ago, I'm not saying how far, uh, that very, that means stomach. These stick with you because once again, pictures and text together stay much longer. You can create little games. This is something I did in one of my first uh, graphic medicine presentations. I created a little game named that gobbledygook. Uh, you can have people draw what they think these terms are. Uh, they seem pretty scary. Uh, esophago gastroduodenoscopy, say that five times fast. Basically, we call it an EGD in the medical field. It's a very common procedure. They just take a light and go down through your esophagus, look at your stomach. It's not major, but it certainly can sound that way. The sphenopalatine ganglioneuralgia is commonly known as an ice cream headache. And transient lingual papillitis is basically a lie bump. But the point of the exercise is to just be creative have them draw it, discuss different answers that people come up with, 
gift prizes, doesn't have to cost anything. You can just top, you know, post the top three somewhere if you're doing this for educational purposes. The point is, if you make it memorable, they will remember, and they're especially going to remember if you uh, are using pictures and text. Zines are a wonderful exercise. They're super easy to make. Here's a picture of some of them. You basically can use a sheet of typing paper and you fold it a certain way and then you draw on the eight sections and you have a little eight page book. You can make it bigger, you can make it smaller. There's lots of YouTube videos. I have some links here at different libraries. Uh, UT Texas has a great one. And so uh, if any of you are interested in these links, all you have to do is let me know and I will be happy to send you a PDF version with all of these links. Other things that you can do, this particular poster, all of the uh, speech bubbles are, uh, you can create anything you want. You can erase them and you can put anything you want. You can move them around and you can do lots of different things. And this is actually free from the European Center for Disease prevention and control, I could see people having some fun with this despite what's going on. You can make infographs. I use Canva to make infographs. I actually put infographs on some of my research guides that are health related. You can make stickers, you can make bookmarks, so many different things that are still considered graphic medicine and are still going to increase uh, people's health literacy. So why should libraries, instructors, and clinicians use graphic medicine? Well, we know that healthcare information changes rapidly and graphic medicine teaches about specific diseases, current treatments, outcomes, and other healthcare information. Sorry about that buzzing. Now, treatments are gonna change. Outcomes are gonna change. But that person's experience with that specific disease isn't going to change. And so even when there might be newer treatments than what is discussed in one of these graphic medicine works, say about, you know, um, attention deficit disorder, doesn't necessarily change that person's journey or decrease the empathy or the relatability of their story. As I said, the first person perspective is often missing from our health texts and medical books. And these can also be a great set of primary resources for any type of studies and research. And then the price, you just can't beat the price. It's very, very affordable. One thing that I would encourage you to do if you're interested in graphic medicine is start with the graphic medicine manifesto. You'll find it on graphicmedicine.org. You'll find it on Amazon. It is a collection of essays from the people that got this off the ground. And it's kind of like, you know, my holy grail of what I can go to when I'm thinking about what am I going to do now with graphic medicine and how can I teach this and how can I learn more about this? It's there. And of course, as with anything, there are some issues. You have to think about pictures are very subjective. They're symbolic and they're gonna mean different things to each reader. The content can be challenged depending upon what kind of setting you're in. You might take this into, you might be a health librarian and take this into a patient's room and their mother just get extremely upset because perhaps there's something in it that goes against some type of, of morals or values that they hold up. And so you have to think about those kinds of things as well. Uh, there's a lot of stigmas associated with comics and cartoons and graphic novels as kids reading, but I assure you that none of them started out for kids. They were all for adults. And even though we have some studies, we need more um, showing that using graphic medicine is actually increasing healthcare literacy. And of course, the National Library of Medicine uh, is a great resource. They have an excellent um, resource called Graphic Medicine, Ill-Conceived and Well-Drawn. It's a traveling exhibit, but online. You can download and 
use lots of their resources like lessons plan, even the university module is there. So I encourage you to go check that out because everything, of course, is free. Graphicmedicine.org, again, it's a wonderful place. We have a Facebook group. Uh, if you're interested, go check it out. Just go to Facebook and look up Graphic Medicine. The people there are just so fabulous and so helpful. What I love about the graphicmedicine.org site, we've got, besides reviews, there's podcasts, there's a database that's in an Excel spreadsheet that you can freely look at, and they do try to update it and keep newer things up, uh, on there as well. There is a sister Japanese manga site, and then there's also Medicina Gráfica, which is the sister Spanish site where there are graphic novels in Spanish. And this is just uh, a piece of their site with some of the Spanish graphic medicine there. And there's an absolutely wonderful administrator uh, that is so helpful and so wonderful. And she's attended many of my presentations. So I have actually given several different um, areas that you can look at. There are some great resources out there. As I said, there is some qualitative studies coming out about health literacy and using it, uh, or excuse me, using graphic medicine to increase health literacy. Uh, this first one on the top is absolutely wonderful. It's brand new. It's using patient charts in comic form to see how well children and adults recall a specific thing about their chart. And it's near 100%. So that is, is probably one of the newer ones out there. There's lots of instruction aids that are available on the web. There's both free and fee-based comic resources, lots of comics that you can get absolutely free. There's some great library guides out there that talk about uh, graphic medicine, health disparities, different things like that. Um, we have one here at the University of Southern Mississippi. I have a health and healthcare disparities guide that has graphic medicine in it. And there's also some UNLV has a wonderful graphic medicine uh, research guide. And then also the University of Southern California. So if you're interested in learning more about graphic medicine, please feel free to contact me at any time. Uh, my email address is on the screen. It's jamie.stanfield at usm.edu. And then lastly, but not least, I want to tell everybody about uh, a new kind of loose coalition coming. Uh, this is Graphic Medicine South. We have a New England Graphic Medicine. We have an International Graphic Medicine. And so, of course, this will be kind of under the International Graphic Medicine umbrella. But what I'd like to do is I know that there are a lot of people in the South that are interested in graphic medicine from various universities, hospitals, physicians. We have a lot of physicians in our graphic medicine group on Facebook. And what I plan to do and what my associate dean is excited about is to have a conference in 2023 right here in Long Beach where you can enjoy the beach even in January or February, whenever we decide to have the conference. And so what I'd like to do is people that are interested, if you would email me and let's talk about it, let's set up some meetings. And I'd like to invite people from all over the states uh, in the South, certainly from our region too, but anybody that is interested is more than welcome. It's not gonna be an organization where I'm gonna ask people to be presidents and things like that, just a loose coalition of people interested in graphic medicine and how it can help health literacy. So that's it. Uh, thank you guys so much for attending. Uh, if there's time, I'll definitely take some questions. Yeah, there's a couple of questions that came in. Uh, first of all, Jamie, thank you so much. That was fantastic and super enlightening. Uh, there was a good bit of discussion in the chat uh, about lie bumps. <laughs> Some people wondered if it was a regional thing. Is that is that a southern term? Um, so folks from different parts of the country had never heard of that. So so there was a fair bit about um, 
about light bulbs. <laughs> okay. You know what? I should have explained that better. So basically, we've all seen them. They're either a little tiny red bump or multiple little bumps or a little white bump that comes up on your tongue. And it has to be a Southern thing because my Southern father is the one that told me that I had lie bumps when I was a little kid. <laughs> and I never lied. <laughs> so we all had those that's tiny what. bumps. So that's what they right. are. I should have explained that a little bit better. Oh, no, no, that's great. It was it was a good discussion point in the, in the chat. Um, there was a question about, um, uh, does anyone have a good list of graphic medical titles that are specifically for kids? Uh, do you know if any of those types of, like, if there's a curated list anywhere that we could make available? Well, uh, School Library Journal has lots of lists of graphic novels, and I don't know if they specifically have a graphic medicine list, but that is definitely something I would be interested in helping someone compile. So whoever asked that, email <laughs> me. Uh, we'll go to the graphic <laughs> medicine Excel sheet, maybe have a little look-see because, you know, maybe we do need to think about curating a list. I think that would be helpful. Yeah, definitely. Um, and there was a question, will the relevant articles and resources be made available? Um, yeah, so the recording of this will, will be made available to all participants also. Um, so you can go back in and rewatch or listen. Um, and I, I don't know if, Jamie, do we maybe have um, uh, a, like a Word document list or a LibGuide or something that we could? Yes. So what I'm going to do is I will zip this up in a PDF format that has all the links live. And I will give that to anybody that wants it. If they'll just sit, shoot me an email, I'll be happy to put that out to them. If there is a place that uh, it could be put, Heather, we could certainly do that. Um, okay. You know, I'm more than happy to that. share. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, uh, looks, I think that was generally the questions that had come in. Lots of compliments and lots of, um, lots of thank yous. Um, for everybody who is still here, I'm going to put a link in the chat. Yes. Um, for the evaluation. Um, and again, if you want uh, CE from the Medical Library Association, once you get to the bottom of the evaluation, um, you can say yes, and then it'll pop up the information that you need for that. Um, and Jamie's email was put in there, but just again, it's uh, Jamie. I'll just I'll just copy and paste it again, just in case. Let's see. Uh, Katie loved the spooky slides. <laughs> Thank you. I, I asked Heather, I said, uh, do you think I could do the spooky thing? It's kind of close to Halloween. And for me, I have 365 days of Halloween, but at the very least, I practice it at, at work 30 days of Halloween. Uh, I was going to wear my uh, Mickey Mouse ears from uh one, I can't even remember her name. What is the evil queen's name that Angelina Jolie played so well? Oh, was it like Mal 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 Maleficent? Maleficent. So I need my own graphic. I don't know how I knew that. <laughs> because I'm clearly forgetting. And so I need to make my own book while I still have at least partial memory. Uh, yeah, I, I thought about wearing them, but I thought oh, that might be a little over the top. But I did want to do the Halloween because I just... I love it so much. If I could feed all of you bloody fingers, I would. And not real ones either. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, I put the link in the chat again for um, the evaluation, uh, but I, I want to uh, ex uh, express my sincere thank you to Jamie for being our first webinar um, and for being one of the first people that I talked to after we got, um, after MUSC got the um, notification that we were going to be the new RML. Um, I talked with Jamie and she was telling me about her work and I was like, well, you need to do a webinar for us. <laughs> so this has been um, months in the making. So I'm happy that it has uh, finally come to fruition. Um, stay tuned, Region 2 will be having more webinars in the future. We'll be advertising them um, as soon as we get them scheduled and um, make uh, the registration available through the training office. And um, we look forward to, to having uh, 
more of you join us. Uh, we also would accept feedback if you have suggestions for topics that you would like to see covered. Um, feel free to send an email to um, us. I'll just put the uh, region two RML nusc.edu um, for you know any ideas or suggestions or other feedback that you have for the RML. Um, now that we're fully staffed, we can get the the team up and take off and do a bunch of things that we've been not able to so far. So very exciting. Thank you all again, um, Jamie, at one point there were 70 attendees. So um, oh, cool. yeah, so I very, very pleased. Thank you so much, everyone. Okay, bye. Thanks for watching. This video was produced by the network of the National Library of Medicine. Select the circular channel icon to subscribe to our channel or select a video thumbnail to watch another video from the channel.